Hello and welcome to Everyday Ethics, your weekly free ethical download from the BBC with me, William Crawley. On this week's podcast, after 35 years membership, a tale of life inside the Church of Scientology. The obsession with money in this church absolutely knows no bounds. Staff members will even arrive at your door, William, at midnight and they will not leave till you max those credit cards. And is Rome finally opening the doors to married priests? If I were a bishop of a diocese that had a very small number of priests and not enough, I would ask permission, I think, of Rome to ordain suitable married men. What is life like inside the Church of Scientology? To many minds, the Church conjures the combined images of something mysterious, together with the celebrity status of high-ranking members, including John Travolta, and Tom Cruise. I've been talking to Karen de la Carriere, who was a member of the church for 35 years. Not just a member, in fact. She was married to the international president of the organisation and one of its highest ranking members. But after leaving the organisation in 2010, she has become an outspoken critic of it. And we'll hear those criticisms in a moment. I should point out that the church vigorously denies her claims. It says she is biased, she's seeking attention, and that her claims are wholly without credibility. We'll have a more detailed statement from the Church of Scientology later, but first, let's hear what Karen de la Carriere has to say. I was in for 35 years. I was a young intern at St Hill East Grinstead, Sussex, because that's where I arrived after... My years in London, and and that was the went, that's the Scientology base within the United Kingdom. Yes, they have the manor there, Saint Hill Manor. It is the Scientology Centre in the United Kingdom. And then I went to the ship, and I trained under Hubbard, the actual founder and creator of Scientology. People who were actually near and close to Hubbard got it directly from what we call source. (laughs) Only seven people on planet Earth ever trained to the level that I did. You could loosely say I was equivalent to a cardinal at the Vatican. And how do you get to that kind of status? Brutal, brutal internships. 60 to 80 hours a week, no day off, no no annual leave, work, 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 videotape your performance. Study, 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 burn the midnight oil. Oh, those internships were brutal. This was 16-hour days. This was, uh, when I say brutal, I mean sleep deprivation and uh, very, very intense. Mm -hmm. Well, why would you want to do that to yourself, Karen? It sounds awfully obsessive. Yes, when I look back on it, um, I was pursuing something that I truly believed in, that had all the promises of advanced spirituality, helping others, helping the planet. I swallowed it all, really, William. I, I was deeply in the tunnel. <laughs> when, did you, when did you wake up, as you describe it, Karen? Scientology is a sort of a cult that teaches you by punishment. In Scientology, it is clobbering and overwhelm. There's no middle way. So to answer your question, when did I wake up? I had two very, very heavy, heavy duty punishments. And after that, uh, it met my threshold and I more or less was done. What were the punishments? (laughs) Well, the first one, I was ordered to run around a pole 12 hours a day. And this went on for months. Now, William, nobody can run around a pole 12 hours a day. You can't. You can't, even if you're a marathon runner. You hobble along, your knees are swollen, your ankles are swollen, but it was a discipline that was punishment. And that made me go, whoa, this is the darker, this is not what I signed up for. This is not religious. It's not ecclesiastical. It's not putting in my so-called ethics. What was the other punishment? The other punishment was heavy, heavy interrogations for months. I was uh, locked up at the famous Inch Base. This is where the 
hierarchy of the church live. It's two hours from Los Angeles. And I had a two-year-old son at the time down in Los Angeles. I wasn't permitted to talk to my husband, who was the president of the Church of Scientology International. I wasn't. I was locked up, and I was interrogated. And I was hauled out of bed at 1 in the morning, and I got further interrogations. The, they use an e-meter, which is like a police polygraph uh, instrument. And um, when you are hounded with questions, you will eventually confess to anything. I did not. I did not break. I did not crack. I did not go over the edge um, way too strong, I believe, spiritually for, for that. But it was just it was too much, William. It was just horrific. And it went on, you know, just about six months. Mm-hmm. What did your husband, who was the president of Scientology International, make of all of that happening to his wife? In Scientology, you are shipped off to wherever they say, whenever they say. There were many issues in Germany. The German government, the German Secret Service was spying on the churches. So my husband, Heber, was sent as a sort of a goodwill ambassador to Germany. And during the time I was going through the worst in these interrogations, he was in Germany. Mm -hmm. Well, it does prompt the question, really, of if this was happening to the wife of the president, what was happening to everybody else? Oh, good question, Will. There is stuff that Hubbard wrote where he talks about punishments are not gruesome enough. There is doctrines that back up such heinous... When you step out of all of this, you think, what wall, what universe did I live in? How did I... How did I buy into all of this? But it does, you know, it does go back to Hubbard. Now, the current leader of the church, David Miscavige, has gone beyond. He's gone way, way higher than even Hubbard's punishment methods. There's many more people who've left the Church of Scientology than are left in the Church of Scientology. And a lot of it comes down to the abuse. How long did you stay in the church, Karen? 35 years of very active participation. And and how much of that time was the dark side of Scientology in your experience? You know, you're treated fairly well when you're new. You're love-bombed, in fact. If you, if you take a frog and throw it into boiling water in a New York second, it'll just lunge out with its hind feet. But if you slowly turn up the heat and let the frog slowly get the tepid water and get hotter and hotter. Eventually, that frog will take water that's almost boiling. And that's a good analogy in Scientology. It's only when your whole family are now involved and you've cut yourself off from the outside world and you're in this. i I, I got to explain something to you. Scientology is different to different. Scientology has a different face. For example, the celebrities like Tom Cruise and stuff, they get a totally different version of Scientology. They're treated like royalty. Then there's the general public, and the public just pay money and get get services. But the, the punishment I'm talking about only happens to the clergy, the C organization, they call themselves. And these are people that sign one billion year religious contracts to serve a billion years. Scientology very much believes in reincarnation, so you're supposed to report back for the next billion years and uh, be part of all of that. The C organization live on base, in the campus, a cut off from the outside world, no cell phones, no iPads, no TV, no newspapers, no visit to the library. That's the cloistered monastic existence that has the abuse. And when I say Scientology is different to different people, if you walk into the church in Tottenham Court Road in London, you would not be locked in a room and abused. You're looked at as a coin that could buy and give them money. So I want to make it quite clear that there are different levels of Scientology, (laughs) depending how much cash you have and how much status and celebrity you bring to the church you are treated exactly proportionate to how valuable you are to the movement. 
So that's where you've come to in, in this journey from believing in the teachings of L. Ron Hubbard to believing that the whole operation really is about money making. The obsession with money in this church absolutely knows no bounds. Staff members will even arrive at your door, William, at midnight, ring the doorbell, a gang of four of them, and they will not leave till you max those credit cards. They want money now, now, now. Who, who, what church would go to your door at midnight and ring the doorbell to ask for money? Money is used a lot to protect the church. They are firewalled by lawyers. It's a church of lawyers and contracts. And these are expensive lawyers that protect the church no matter what the church does. In response to what you've said uh, in a Daily Mail interview, the church has said that you're spreading falsehoods, that you have a personal axe to grind, and that you're behaving like a lunatic. <laughs> yeah, I saw that. Yeah. Uh -huh. That doesn't surprise but you. You know, they didn't deny anything that I said. They didn't refute it. They didn't say, no, we never made her run around a pole 12 hours a day. No, we never. Da, 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 da. They just gave a generality. Oh, she's a lunatic. Blah, 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 blah. I, I, I feel that response very weak. Do I have an axe to grind? Maybe I do have an axe to grind. Do you know the story of my son, Alexander Jench? No, tell me, tell me that story. Well, he, you know, he grew up in the cult. I was very much into it all. And once I started speaking out, they emphatically turned him against me. They made him disconnect from me. It's called shunning or disconnection. And he gave me that last call two years before he died. It was very poignant. And he said, Mom, you mustn't email me. You mustn't text me. You mustn't phone call me. Until you get yourself squared away with the church. See, he was on orders. The church was a third party in mother-son relationship. The church had to approve of me before I could talk to my son. Anyway, long story, he had pneumonia. He got fired from his job in Dallas-Fort Worth, and he had pneumonia, walking pneumonia, and he didn't have money to see. He didn't have medical treatment, and he died. When they did the autopsy, he had no antibiotics. 98% of people who have pneumonia are cured with antibiotics. Anyway, a stranger on Facebook let me know that he, his dead body was lying in the morgue in Los Angeles. Imagine finding out your son is dead on, by a Facebook message from a stranger. The church did not have the respect. They didn't even pick up the phone to tell me that the dead body of my son was lying in Los Angeles morgue. There he was lying with a toe tag, and uh, they arranged with the funeral home and everything that I'd be denied a last viewing. Uh, by now, I had been a strong voice, William. I've, I've, I'm, I'm, I talk a lot. I whistle blow a lot, and uh, they would not let me see the dead body, and they quickly got the dead body cremated, and I didn't even get the ashes. I got nothing. So when you say axe to grind, can you imagine slaving and contributing for 35 years to the very entity, the entity I served, cut the relationship of my one and only child so that he died? And I made a couple of videos on this. I believe the Church of Scientology is completely responsible for his death because <laughs> he couldn't come to me for money. So he had no medical diagnosis, and he died. Hmm. He died because the church's toxic policy of disconnection. And they quickly hired a criminal lawyer who had done a lot of work for them to protect the in-laws in the house where Alex... They had money to hire a criminal lawyer when Alexander Jench died, but they didn't have money to give him medical diagnosis so he could take antibiotics when he was alive. There's no money for life. But there was money to protect themselves in death. So when you say axe to grind, I, uh, I, this is my story. I, I live, you know, in the cold light, three in the morning. I live with knowing that 
the way I engineered my life, ultimately I'm responsible that I raised a child in the cult that he would believe and swallow the disconnection policy. He grew up in all of that. He knew nothing else, and he disconnected from me. Am I responsible that Alexander Jensch knew anything of Scientology? Absolutely, I'm responsible. Scientology was always pretty tough. It was, it was always tough. It was always punitive. But in the 70s and 80s, there was no internet. There was no iPod. There was no Twitter. There was no message boards. There was no blogs. Data didn't travel at the speed of light. Therefore, a lot of Scientology's dirty little secrets were kept curtailed and buried. But the world has changed in front of our very noses. That starts a snowball or avalanche of others reading what others are saying, and they become more courageous to talk more. And let, let me tell you something. The church is feverishly trying to stop this. And when you walk into a church of Scientology, right now, as a brand new person, you sign four unconscionable contracts. The first contract you sign, it's a non-disparagement contract. Mm. You sign that you will never, never, never talk to someone like William on the radio. This is as you enter the door. This is the damage control to stop the horror stories being leaked. There's another contract you sign, which is giving them permission to lock you up if you have a mental breakdown. Just finally, Karen, uh, I've I've spoken to people who have left Scientology before about their their attitude now to L. Ron Hubbard, the founder of of Scientology, and people seem to take different views on this. Some people believe that the church has moved away from his original vision, and they're very critical of the contemporary church. Others are, are very critical of him and and believe that he was part of and and in fact the foundation of the darkness that they experience. What's your attitude? Hubbard did have a darker side, no question about it. And I think that the reason Scientology is in the state it is in now is the abuse or the very strict punitive things that Hubbard wrote have greatly contributed to the state of affairs now. Uh, There is a terrible mind control kind of program called the Rehabilitation Project Force. Well, that was Hubbard. Hubbard invented that. Now, I know that certain parts of the technology give very good results, but even if you get this goodness, at what cost? At what cost? I may have had a win here and a win there, and I can do this, and I'm a walking success story of how affluent you can become, but at what cost? I lost my only child. I paid this kind of cost because I was involved in that. Why didn't I just go to the gentle Buddhists and if I needed a guru, why didn't I go to train under the Dalai Lama? Why didn't I choose some Vedantism? If if I was that compulsive to to join a, any kind of religion, why did I have to choose an abusive religion? Karen de la Carriere, and of course we invited the uh, Church of Scientology Uh, to put up a representative to respond uh, to that interview and to those allegations this morning. Uh, And instead, they've given us a statement. And, of course, they vigorously deny the allegations, as was made clear within the interview. Uh, And in their statement, they they say that Karen de la Carrier is not credible and has not held a staff position in the church for going on 25 years. Therefore, it doesn't have access to material about its management or its activities. It's a very detailed statement to the programme, which we've done our best to summarise. And it says this, in response to the claim that Scientology is a cult that teaches through punishment, the church says her claim is false and insulting. Regarding her allegations of two heavy-duty punishments... The church says Ms. de la Carriere voluntarily participated in spiritual programmes for her own salvation and they bear no resemblance to her false and distorted descriptions. You'll also remember that Ms. de la Carriere told us that L. Ron Hubbard, the church's founder, wrote that punishments were not gruesome enough. 
The church, in its statement, says that, in fact, Mr Hubbard wrote the opposite. Then, regarding her claims surrounding the church and her son, the church says she exploits that tragedy to falsely blame it and her former husband, and she was responsible for the alienation from him. The church also responds to her claim that more people have left the church than remain in it. It says the reverse is the case, and that the church is growing now at a faster rate than any time in its history. And finally, the church also stresses that it treats all members in the same way, regardless of their income or their status.